Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, the early service is always asleep. Good morning, church. Good morning. There you go. Now I know you're wide awake and wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to worship the Lord this morning. Good to see you this morning. Thank you so much for getting up early to come to the first service and worship with us today. I want to welcome those who are watching online today and invite you to go to twrtimes.com where you can pick up your listening guide and follow along with the uh, sermon today. Sing with us, worship with us, pray with us, and uh, receive from the Lord a blessing with us this morning. Let's turn to the Lord this morning and ask Him to prepare our hearts and our minds as we look to greet Him and to hear from Him this morning. Father, what a joy it is when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, we're here so that we can gather together corporately and worship You. And Father, we can hear from You. We invite You right now, Holy Spirit, to speak Your Word with power and truth into our hearts and our lives. Plant it deep within us that it may take root and grow. Father, teach us this morning how to live that life of spiritual victory that you have planned for us to have. And for that, we'll give you thanksgiving and praise. Inhabit our praise this morning. Be honored and glorified in all that we say and do. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Worship team, come lead us this morning. Good morning. Stand sing with us. Sweet, sweet spirit. Yeah. 
Amen. Appreciate that choir and praise team. Wonderful worship this morning. Take your Bibles, if you will, and join me in the New Testament, the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. This week I read a very common sense statement written by William Andrew Ward about the way that we live together in the world. And here's what he said. He said, we could choose to throw stones, to stumble on them, to climb over them, or to build with them. He said, the first three choices, throwing, stumbling, and climbing over, are choices of the flesh. The last, building, is the pull of God's Spirit against the flesh. I'm going to be honest with you this morning, the choices that you and I make as Christians in this life that we live is going to be filled with tensions between our flesh and the Holy Spirit. The struggle between the flesh and the Spirit is something that is very, very real. In this series, we've been talking about the things that are going to issue great challenges to our faith this year, and and of course, uh, over the course of this new year. And one of the things that we're going to consistently wrestle with is that spiritual struggle between our fleshly appetites and the pull of the Holy Spirit in our life. And uh, Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, is introducing a concept to Christians that says, listen, you have a choice. You can live by one of two ways. You can can live in freedom and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, or you can choose to continue to walk in bondage to the flesh, and, and, and we got the choice that we've got to make. Paul, writing to the Galatians, he writes this, beginning of verse 16 of chapter 5. He said, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. Paul, in this passage, is giving us a warning and a better way. I want to begin this morning with looking at the warning that Paul is giving to us. He says, listen, there is a way that a Christian can live, and it will bring spiritual disaster. Uh, It's known as the flesh life. Paul points out that the flesh, our flesh, is opposed to the spirit. There is a real warfare going on in the believer's life. And I'm not talking about the spiritual warfare that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm not talking about that outward battle. I'm talking about a real inward battle. I'm talking about the warfare that's taking place in our lives on a daily basis, that pull between what we used to be and what we currently are in the Spirit. Uh, Paul describing his struggles in Romans 7, that, uh, that twisted thing, you know, I, 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 this is what I want to do, and then I don't do it, and then I want to do this, and I don't do that, and I wish I wouldn't do this, but I did do that. And in that twisted passage of uh, Romans chapter 7, Paul points out that he has a problem with sin. Three times in that passage, he says, listen, sin continues to dwell in me. He's referring, of course, to the old fleshly appetite. So I want to just give you a definition this morning. He said, what are you talking about by sinful appetites? A sinful appetite, it could be defined as a strong desire or an urge. Uh, We typically associate it with food or drink, but in this particular case, it can be anything from uh, a powerful wish, including longing for security, craving for wealth, or or, uh, sexual desires, or, or other things. Things that would gratify my flesh instead of glorifying the Lord. And in seeing this, he's, he's telling us, listen, we've, we've got this battle going on. Every believer has these appetites that is dwelling within them. And according to worldly wisdom, somebody says, well, listen, the best way for you and I to overcome our unhealthy desires is, is to adhere to a series of rules or a series of guidelines. Well, God wants us to depend upon Him. He wants you and I to, to put our faith and trust in Him. Because absolute morals do provide for us standards of behavior, but God says, listen, I've given you something better than that. I have given to you the gift of the Holy Spirit to live in you and to dwell in you, to give you the power and the ability to overcome the desires of the flesh. Now, God gives to us and every believer the gift of the Holy Spirit. He reminded the Corinthians and he reminds you and I. Every single believer's body is the temple, the dwelling place, of the Holy Spirit. 
So the Holy Spirit lives within every believer. And, and Paul reminds us of this. He goes on to explain to us how the Spirit of God can give us and enable us to have victory over our old flesh appetites and, and in this struggle with the flesh. However, there are many pronouns in that passage in Romans 7 that indicate Paul is having a problem with self. Now, you know, listen, he's not suggesting the Christian is some kind of split personality. Uh, you know, we need to understand something because I think sometimes we give ourselves some excuses. But according to the Word of God, a believer is a new creation in Christ. And as such, we no longer have a sin nature, we now have a spiritual nature. And so, in saying that, salvation makes us new. It makes us whole. Uh, the believer uh, still, though, has a problem with the way we think. We still have a problem with the way we feel. We still have a problem with controlling our wills and our desires. Uh, we still want to, from time to time, uh, forget about glorifying the Lord and just worry about satisfying ourselves. In other words, we're either controlled in everyday living by the flesh and its desires, or by the Holy Spirit and His direction. Notice that Paul's statement about his own struggles indicated that Paul had uh, two serious problems in Romans 7. He, he said that simply this, he said, I can't do the good I want to do, and I seem to do the evil that I don't want to do. This is a constant struggle for me, he says. Uh, does this mean that Paul could not stop himself? Does this mean that Paul couldn't stop breaking the law of God? Does this mean that Paul was a consistent liar and a thief and a murderer? Well, of course not. That's not what he's saying at all. Uh, Paul was saying that in himself, within his own strength, within his own power, within his own fleshly ability, he had no ability to follow and fulfill the law of God. And uh, even on his best days, he says that this evil fleshly appetite is still present within me. No matter, no matter what I seem to want to do, I still have, uh, the, it's still tainted by sin. I still have these evil desires that I struggle with, wrestle with on a daily basis. It, even when he had done his best, he admitted, he said that he was an unprofitable servant. He said, I find this law at work within me. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. And so we need to understand that our Christian life is not a playground it's a, it's a battlefield. Uh, John MacArthur, Jr. writes this. He says, uh, he says, Paul's statement about flesh being weak is not to be heard as a, as a uh, it is to be heard as a warning and not as an excuse. In other words, we're not to say, well, you know, the reason why I sin, the reason why I fail, the reason why I do these things is because, you know, I'm weak in the flesh. He says, listen, that's not, it's not written to be an excuse. It's written to be a warning that is to be heeded. Our fleshly appetites can be very dangerous if they're not taken serious. You see, our flesh is opposed to the Spirit. But we also need to understand that the flesh is open to any sin. Did you know that man is capable of doing anything imaginable and even some things unimaginable? You say, what are you talking about? Oh, let's take, for example, Susan Smith. Susan Smith was a former student of the University of South Carolina and a mother. But on July 22, 1995, she was convicted of drowning deaths of her two sons, uh, three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alexander. The case got worldwide attention because before they convicted her, shortly after the whole situation developed, she claimed that a black man had carjacked her car and kidnapped her children. Never, I bet you never in a million years would she have thought that she was capable of such an action. Yet O.J. Simpson, nicknamed the Juice, a Heisman Trophy winner, college pro and hall, uh, hall of famer, broadcaster, actor, and convicted felon. Here's a man that should have been on top of the world, not under the jailhouse. And, and, and for all intents and purposes, he should have been a grand success. But when his flesh was given freedom, just like you and I, it could take us to some pretty ugly places, causing us to do some things that we never would have thought about doing or dreamt of doing. Somebody says, well, Pastor, you know, I'm familiar with those cases, and those are those people. I would never, never say never. Never say never me. Paul said, listen, you be careful that before you go preaching about stuff like that, that you don't become disqualified yourself. Listen, I bet you that Peter, the leader of the apostles, until Paul came along, 
the leader of the disciples. I bet you Peter never in his wildest imagination dreamt there would come a time when he would stand close enough to his Lord and Savior and curse him and deny that he knew him. But when the flesh took over, that's what he did. David probably never would have thought in all of his life about uh, becoming a murderer. Yet in a single night, giving into a flesh desire, he had an affair which resulted in a fling, which resulted in a murder, and David was guilty of that murder. The flesh is capable of anything without exception. And you and I need to be aware that these fleshly desires that are alive and well within us need to be taken extremely serious. Uh, listen, the flesh is capable of anything. The flesh is opposed to the spirit. It's open to sin. But thirdly, Paul points out that the flesh is ordained for judgment. You say, what do you mean? Well, we know that any person, somebody said one time, said that, uh, that hell is not going to be full of people that God rejected. It's going to be full of people who rejected God. Anybody who dies in their sin has literally rejected the salvation of the wonderful gift of grace and mercy of God that gave to us when he so loved us that he gave us his son to die on a cross for us, that whoever, whosoever believed upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. If people die in their sin, we know the Bible tells us that they are going to suffer with an eternity of separation from God and eternal hell that was created for the devil and his angels, not for man. We also know the saint who chooses to walk in the flesh instead of the spirit will face the chastisement of the Lord because he loves us and he chastens those that he loves. We know that all believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul tells us that each one may receive what is due for him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That is, whether in the flesh or in the spirit. So what you and I are understanding what Paul is saying is that while all believers, uh, no believer will answer for their sin, because that's under the blood of Jesus. That's been wiped away by the blood of Christ. Every believer has been, has been saved from their sin. There's no condemnation that's laid against those who are in Christ. However, one day we will give an account for our service and whether, how we lived our life. Did I live my life for the glory of God or for the glory of me? Did I live my life in the, according to the, the, the desires of the flesh or according to the direction of the Holy Spirit that God gave me? Now, one of the greatest truths that Satan wants to hide from us is that, that, uh, that Paul told the Corinthians, he said, listen, if you judge yourself, you won't come into judgment. But the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, uh, we don't oftentimes judge ourselves. We don't oftentimes take these desires of the flesh as serious as we should and take action against them. Now, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. If a believer walks in the flesh and not in the spirit, if a believer chooses to walk in rebellion to God and not in obedience to God, it does not mean that he's going to lose his salvation or that he is going to somehow be prevented from getting into heaven. However, what we do need to understand is that the believer who chooses to walk in the flesh will be led into a much greater chance of a life of dangerous and destructive activity. God did not mean for us to live a life of defeat. He did not mean for the believer to live a life in bondage to the flesh. He freed you from that when he gave to us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if a believer uh, has slipped into a life of the flesh, let me be very clear. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, well, you know, my life is basically summed up by gratifying the flesh. Is it, you know, is there, what should I do? Well, let me tell you, if that's the case for you and you are a true believer and the Holy Spirit is living in you, it's not all right. It's not all right. That, that needs to be addressed. You need to change course. You need to confess those things to the Lord. And, uh, and, and, and when you do, they will be met with a cleansing and a forgiveness and a release from that. And you can begin today to begin to walk in obedience to the Lord and following the Holy Spirit. You'll be forgiven. But Paul says, listen, here's the warning. The way of the flesh is the way of spiritual disaster. But here's the good news. He said, but there is a way of spiritual delight known as the spirit life. Listen to what he says in verse 16. He, he tells us that I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, God has already given to us this victory. Paul says the spirit gives us victory over our lust of the flesh. But we have to play a part in gaining this victory. There is a role for you to play. There's a role for me to play in order for me to experience the victory that God has promised to me. I have to choose 
to walk in the Spirit. I have to choose to give myself to the Spirit. To walk means to surrender. And Paul says, listen, when you surrender to the, to the leadership, to the direction of the Holy Spirit, instead of to the desires of the flesh, when you follow the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will defeat those desires of the flesh. He'll keep you straight. The Spirit will, uh, if we allow Him to, He will give us the victory. He will, listen, if we'll be led either by the flesh or by the Spirit, and the one that we choose is the one that we follow. Reminds me of the little boy outside the general store that had two dogs, and an elderly gentleman came up and asked him, he said, son, if those dogs got in a fight, which one would win? And the little boy said, I guess the one I feed. And that's absolutely true. It's, it's true of us. Once we understand this, you know, so we got to understand that the one that we feed, the flesh or the spirit, is the one that's going to win the battle of the day. It's the one that's going to win the battle of our life. And, and uh, once we understand the desires of the flesh are at war with the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden I realize, wait a second, I've got far more control in this situation than what I ever gave myself credit for. I'm the deciding factor. I'm the one who gets to choose who rules and reigns in my life. Now, somebody says, well, how do I do that? Well, you and I all know what our fleshly desires and appetites are. So there are some places to avoid. There are some people to avoid. There are some things to avoid. There are some images to avoid. Maybe some music to avoid. Anything that brings temptation to us, anything that, that threatens to excite or to fulfill those fleshly desires ought to be avoided because when we mess around with it, listen, let's be honest. Paul said, when I mess around with this stuff, I understand I'm so weak in my flesh, it's going to eat my lunch. It's, go it's going to have its way with me. I'm going to give in if I don't die to that. Paul says, listen, if you walk in the Spirit, you'll have victory over the lust of the flesh. But he also says, listen, verse 18, he says the Spirit gives us victory over the law. For the believer, I'm still commanded by the law of God. Just because I'm a, a, a born-again believer, just because I've given my life to Christ, does not mean the law has no place in my life. I'm not condemned by it, but I'm still commanded by it. Uh, because I walk in the Spirit, uh, it serves a different purpose in my life. Once I become a believer, the law now becomes something that I desire to follow and to fulfill. And, uh, and because God writes His law in my heart, and my desire is to be pleasing to Him and to give Him control of my life. And so for the believer, the law of God is not a condition to be met for salvation, but rather obedience to it is an indicator of whether or not I am truly a believer. Listen, regardless of what you and I say about Jesus, our life tells the truth. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So the threat of judgment is removed when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And simply stated, we do not have to remain in a tug of war that, is, that it, Paul talks about in verse 17. Reminds me of the two fellows who were moving a sofa. And they got halfway through the door, and they got stuck. And they pushed, and they pulled, and they pushed, and they pulled. And finally, one said to the other one, we're never going to get this thing in. He said, in? We don't have to get stuck in that battle. We don't have to, we don't have to keep that, that tug of war going on with us. The Spirit gives us victory over the lust of the flesh. It gives us victory over the law. And listen, when we make the determination as to how we're going to surrender our lives and to whom we're going to surrender our lives, we own that. That's my decision. It's your decision. You get to choose which one you want to follow and how you're going to live and what your life is going to say. And so uh, he says, listen, notice the flesh produces works, uh, a, a life of labor. It's, a, it's, it's activity. But then Paul goes on to say, well, no, wait a second. He said, but there is a fruit of the Spirit that is produced in the life of a believer. Now, fruit is a, is a, a process. It's passive. It's a life of leisure. In other words, uh, fruit is a natural result of abiding in the, in the vine or in the, the branch. Now, you recall that Jesus uh, gave this illustration, this lesson to the disciples. 
Remember he told them, he said, I, they, perhaps they were out in the vineyards, and Jesus said in the, in the garden there at Gethsemane, full of vineyards, maybe Jesus said, look, fellows, see these grapevines? He said, listen, I, I am the vine, you guys are the branches. I want you to just picture this. I'm, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Now, uh, i got to tell you, what he's basically saying here is this. Let me put it in Florida terms for us. You walk out into any orange grove anywhere where the trees are full of oranges, and I guarantee you, you will see the fruit, but you will never hear an orange tree going, ah! trying to pop that fruit out. Why not? Because it doesn't work that way. It's a natural process. As long as the, the, the root system is healthy and the branch is attached to the tree, the fruit will pop out naturally. It will be produced. And the branch never struggles to produce fruit as long as it's connected to the healthy source of the tree. As long as we abide in Jesus, who is our vine, and the Holy Spirit is allowed to let his life, the life of Christ, the vine, the true vine, flow through us, all of a sudden what you will find is an effortless production of healthy fruit. The fruit of the Spirit will automatically be produced in and through the branches. Now, in the life of the believer, the Spirit is always producing fruit. By the way, these are characteristics that Paul is about to run through. These are characteristics that ought to be true and evident and present in every believer without exception. Just like evil works characterize the life of the lost, fruit of the Spirit is proof of salvation and the life of the believer. Let's run through this list of characteristics that Paul gives. He said the first one is love. Listen, we ought to have the characteristics of love. We ought to be loving God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, we, we are to love God above all else. We are to love others. Jesus taught us, listen, you love me, you love the Lord first, you love your neighbor second, you love yourself last. That's how we're to do it. He says, listen, this is, this is the first of the characteristics. And then he says, then there's joy. Joy is that constant and consistent delight in God. Uh, this reminds me of the Hindu trader in India who once asked a missionary, he said, what is it that you guys put on your face to make it shine like that? The missionary looked at him and he said, well, I, I don't understand. He said, I don't put anything on my face. And the Hindu trader got a little bit impatient with him. He emphatically said, yes, you do. All you guys do. All you Christian people, you all got it on your face. All of a sudden, he realized what he was talking about. And he, he said, well, sir, he said, uh, you're mistaken. He said, it's not something I put on. It's something that comes from within. He said, it is, it is the glory of God that is reflected through us. It is the love of God that is reflected through us. It's not something I put on my face. It's something God put in my heart, and it shines through my face. Paul adds to us peace. He says, you know, the, another characteristic is you ought to have peace. When the Spirit rules in our lives, we'll experience peace in three areas. We'll experience peace with God, with others, and with ourselves. Paul says not only that, but every Christian ought to be long-suffering, willing to accept and bear injustice and injury in service to the Lord. He says, let me tell you, there's another characteristic you ought to have, gentleness. This is a sweetness of attitude, easy to get along with, easy to please. It's, it's that person who is not constantly grumbling and griping and complaining, but rather they are kind and they are gentle. Gentleness is merely just an, uh, an attitude of kindness. Paul says there's another characteristic of goodness, a willingness to do good, a willingness to help others. Literally, it's nothing more than Christian love in action. Paul says there's faith. I don't have the characteristic of faith, the ability to trust God no matter what, and to be trusted by God, and be trusted by man. Every child of God ought to be faithful to God, not because the preacher says so, but they ought to do it out of their own love for God. I read about Lewis Laws, who became the warden of the Sing Sing prison in 1920. The inmates existed in wretched conditions when he took over, which led him to introduce humanitarian uh, uh, reforms. He, he gave much of the credit to his wife, Catherine, however, who has always treated the prisoners with uh, great humanity. He said that she would often take her three children and sit with the gangsters, murderers, and racketeers when they played basketball and baseball. But in 1937, Catherine was killed in a car accident, and the next day, her body was laid in a casket 
in a house about a quarter mile from the institution. So when the warden showed up the next day, he found hundreds of prisoners crowded around the main entrance, and he knew what they wanted. So this is what he did. He opened the gate, and he said, Men, I'm going to trust you. You can go to the house. No count was taken. No guards were posted. Yet that evening at check-in, not one man was missing. Love for the one who had loved them made these men dependable. Christ has revealed the Father's love for us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And because of what he did at Calvary, we can have and be freed from our sins bondage and the condemnation of the law and be free to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And unlike these prisoners, we don't have to return to confinement, yet the same motive that kept them from running away also ought to keep us faithful in service to the Lord. May our love for him more than our fear, more than shame, more than a sense of duty, be the reason for what we do. Paul then points out to us the next characteristic. He said there ought to be meekness in your life. Meekness is that restraint of power, if you will. It's, a, it's power under control. It's the picture of a wild stallion who has been tamed. It is that kind of power under control. And, and he says, listen, meek Christians don't throw their weight around. Meek Christians don't try, to, don't try to throw their weight around. Now, let me be clear. Meekness is not weakness. Jesus was meek. He wasn't weak. Moses was meek, but he wasn't weak. Neither of these men would be considered to be weak. Paul then references the characteristic of temperance, which is self-control. Refusing to do those things you have to do in your own power. This is an attitude whereby my life is searched, and I'm certain that it is under submission to the will of God and Christ. I'm looking at my life, and I'm saying, are all the weights and hindrances laid aside, besetting sins are dealt with? This is the opposite of the majority of a lot of majority of Christian lives, most people feel like that they're allowed to live their lives as they please. A lot of Christians say, you know what, uh, Jesus saved me, I'm going to heaven, I don't care now, I can do whatever I want to do. Is that really true? And the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, we do have great liberty. We do have tremendous freedom. You are kind of free to choose to do whatever you want. I hear people all the time say, I just think God wants me to give up too much. Well, you're right. He does tell you to give up things that hinder your relationship to him. He asks us to give our lives to him, to be used for him, for his good, for, or for our good, for his glory. He does ask us to do that. He doesn't call on us to be dead sacrifices, though. He calls on the believer to be living sacrifices. Every child of God is commanded to render his life as a living sacrifice to the Lord, which is your reasonable service, Paul says. These things can never be counterfeited by the unbeliever. It's absolutely impossible for an unsaved person to possess the fruit of the Spirit. They may have some similarities. But let me tell you what... What this dumb kid did as a, as a child, I can tell you from firsthand experience, artificial fruit looks like it's good to taste, but it's not. And imitations are not real, no matter how much you want them to be. Uh, you know, the, these are not fruits, plural. A lot of people say, well, man, I, I got to tell you, I, I, God's working on me, and I got some of those fruits, but I don't have all those fruits. No, sorry. It's not plural, it's singular. It's one fruit. You either have them or you don't have them. You don't have some of them some of the time and missing others other, other times, you either have them or you don't. God expects them to be present at all times in our lives. All these things that will be present in the life of the believer all at once. How is that possible? How, how can I possibly do that. I'm weak in the flesh. We've talked about that. Don't you know? 
It's only by resting in the vine and yielding to the Holy Spirit so that he can live the life that he desires to live through us. The Christian who flirts with the flesh is, in effect, flirting with disaster. Paul said you've got to reckon yourself dead. He said, what in the world does that mean? Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but it is Christ who lives in me. That means to say that we need to make dead these fleshly appetites. It means I've got to turn my back on those appetites. Cut them off. Consider them, reckon them, however you want to say it, starve them until they're dead. And feed the Spirit so that the Spirit directs me instead of the desires of the flesh. Now, the Holy Spirit will defeat our flesh and give us the victory over, uh, over this as we surrender to Him. Paul caps it all off in verse 25 when he says this. Listen, if we say that we are saved, then we should seek to walk like the Bible says that a saved person should walk. That is by God's will. That is in accordance with God's word. That is by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Because if you're saved, then you are alive and the Spirit is alive within you and you are no longer what you were. But now, you are something new. You're something different. And we are to act and live like what we are. We can judge our life by the results we see of our faith whether we're passing the test of overcoming the flesh or not, we just look at the examples of our life and see that. Uh, are we bearing glory to the Lord or are we producing works of the flesh? We can see that very clearly. It's very evident in our life. And regardless of what your answer may be, you can begin right now to, become, to begin to overcome those appetites of the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Admitting before God, Lord, indulging in wayward appetites is disobedience. I know that. Forgive me for my disobedience. I agree with him that not only are the effects of sin painful, but they are risky. And they are dangerous. Paul's message reminds me of a man who one time saw a bald eagle soaring in circles overhead. He said that, uh, that he, he circled around and the circles began to get tighter and he said, I looked over and I saw a weasel. And suddenly, he said, the eagle dropped out of the sky like a jet. He caught the weasel in its talons. And amazingly, as the eagle began to fly away, he said, the weasel began to eat away at the breast of the eagle. He said, I watched as the weasel tore away at the eagle, snapping bones and chewing flesh. Suddenly, the eagle folded up and crashed to the ground, and the weasel just went on his way. And the moral of the story is, sometimes getting what you want doesn't always work out the way you think it will. Sometimes the things we want are the very things that can serve to destroy us. Paul says, I'm going to give you two concepts, or the concept that you get to choose. He says, listen, you can walk in the freedom of the Spirit, or you can walk in the bondage of the flesh. The choice is yours. One's a way of spiritual disaster. The other's a way of spiritual delight. And today, you get to choose which one you want. Pray with me. Father, we... Thank you for your word, the power of your word. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who gives us victory over our flesh, frees us to live in the spiritual delight. We acknowledge today that indulgence in our fleshly appetites are disobedience, dangerous, and for us are no way to meet our true needs. We ask you, Lord, to help us today to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit so we may be led by him and act like who we are and who you've made us to be. Father, we...
ask this in the name of Jesus this morning. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray with me this morning together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is my song. wonderful to know that is our story and we can praise our savior all day long because he has promised to us a life of spiritual victory so as you leave this place you go out in that mission field live like who you are and display your victory by being led by the spirit instead of the desires of the flesh and give honor and glory to his name this week as you present jesus to all those that you meet by being jesus to all those you meet god bless you see you back here next sunday